1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. Still reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, now I'm reading at verse 2. By which also you were saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, And that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present day, but some are fallen asleep. After that, Speaking of Christ after the resurrection, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due season. Paul had seen Jesus by a supernatural revelation of God. Paul goes on to say in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles, kind of startling. And I'm not even meet or worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. I want to speak to you this morning on the iron-fisted grace of God. And I'll explain that title to you a little bit later on because it has a very special meaning to me. 1 Corinthians 15 is one of those great all-inclusive chapters. There's several like that. All the Word of God is good, but you take like a Romans 8, it just puts, puts so much together. John 15 puts together so much about, you know, the, the process of the vine and so on. A Mark 4 talks to us about seeds, the four soils, and then Mark 11, about the ongoing process of faith in your heart and faith in prayer. But a conversation this week quickened this in my heart. The iron-fisted grace of God. Looking again at what Paul had to say, he said, I preached the gospel, you received it. You're standing in what you received. Then Paul goes on to say that Christ died for our sins. And I tell you, Christ died for all of our sins. I said Christ died for all of our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Everything's according to the Word of God. And then he was seen of all of that host, even 500 at once. And then... Of course, the apostles. But after all of that, Paul then zeroes in on something that's a cornerstone of his life. It's part of his, what could you say, motivation that keeps him going. A lot of very successful people have a place or a thing or a book or a motto or something that they do, that they go there, and it reminds them to keep on keeping on. Paul said in that ninth verse, I am the least of the apostles. And I'm not even worthy to be called 
and apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I don't blame the negative part of me on God, but I tell you the, the good, the positive part of everything about me in my life, I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, let's see if we can sort of unfold that and maybe have a little more insight into these awesome truths that we've shared. Paul said, I'm the least. You know, if there's one thing that'll keep you on two feet, it's don't become proud. He that thinketh he standeth, let him take heed lest he fall. In my adversity, I said, bless God, I'll never be moved. What's wrong with you? Always remember that we're to live in love and compassion. Paul said, I'm the least of all. I'm not worthy. I persecuted the church of God. I did things that were terribly wrong. Well, maybe that testimony could apply to a lot of us here today. I, I'm the least. Why did God choose us out of the millions of people on the earth? Why did you choose God? There's a grace factor there. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. None of us are worthy. We don't walk down to this altar call because we're worthy. Oh, yeah, Lord, you've been waiting on me, haven't you? Here I am. No, we're not worthy. If you want to know the bottom line of it, I'm not worthy to be saved. I'm not worthy to have been kept. I'm not worthy to be called into the ministry. I'm not worthy to receive all the wonderful things that God has done. But it all revolves around that amazing grace of God. No wonder it's a sweet sound that saved what used to be a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. So Paul said, I'm the least. I'm not worthy. I persecuted the church of God. He said, I did wrong. I did wrong things. Well, does anybody want to stand up and say, I'm the one person here today that has never done a wrong thing? I think not. But he goes on to say, but by the grace of God, not because my name is Nichols or Smith or Jones or whatever your name, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. The good part, the positive part, of what I am is by the grace of God. Now, I've never heard of a definition on grace that I didn't like. Seems like people seem to get grace right. Unmerited favor of God is the old classic that we've heard throughout all of my lifetime from a little boy up in church. But there's another one that I like, and I believe it was Charles Capps that said, the grace of God is God's willingness to give you his very best even though you don't deserve it. That's a mouthful right there. God's willingness to give you his very best, even though you don't deserve it. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Then Paul went on to say something else. There's a responsibility to grace. His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. God doesn't save you to be a zero. God doesn't save you to have a little warm, fuzzy feeling and then walk away and live your own life. There's a responsibility. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. T'was grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Folks, there's a responsibility to this amazing grace of God. It's free. It's unmerited. It's the joy of the heart of God to give us his best even though we don't deserve it. But he said his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Then Paul went on to make this statement. I have labored more abundantly than they all. Sounds a little prideful. But in Texas we say it ain't bragging if you've done it.
Anywhere I go in the world, sooner or later, somebody say, you're from Texas, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. Whether it's London or Adelaide or Sydney or Uganda or wherever. I've labored more abundantly than they all. Ephesians 2, remember verse 8 said, for by grace are you saved through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, now this sounds like a contradiction. Paul said, I labored more than them all. You see, here's the thing about it. I'm not laboring to be saved. I'm laboring because I am saved. I'm not living, giving, praying, going. Last three weeks has been one of the most giving, going pouring out of my lives that I've experienced in a long, long time. Many thousands of miles in different directions and different groups and different situations. Why? I don't need to sightsee. If I wanted to sightsee, I'd go somewhere else. But because someone seems to need the gift of God that is in you, that lives next door, in your neighborhood, where you work, He said, yet not I, I've labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. But this empowering and enabling grace of God in me has helped me to accomplish this. Paul said, I couldn't do what I've done. I couldn't do what I'm doing today. It's by God's grace. Your resume didn't get you born again. Would have probably kept you from it. My precious wife, sterling character, morally pure, the crown jewel of all the kids. But that wouldn't save her. Yet not I. Yet not I. I'm taking my time here. Yet not I. 1 Corinthians 15, the latter part of the verse 10. Yet not I. Not Bob Nichols, but the grace of God which was with me. Something's been with you since the moment you got saved. Something's been with you before you ever got saved. And I'm going ahead of myself here. Look at Paul's accomplishments. You say, well, what did this man do? Well, you know... If you'll just take a serious look at the Word of God, he went through some tough stuff. I mean, Paul went through things that I, don't, I think all of us might have quit and gone home or done something different. Paul said, I was in shipwreck and I was in prison. My, you look at what this man went through. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, folks, we need to look at these things. I'm not f- filling time. We're talking about a real man by the name of the Apostle Paul who's responsible under Jesus for many of us being in this room today. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, the next time you start poor-mouthing how hard it is to serve God, how hard to heavy my burden is, no, no one understands. Are they members of Christ? Paul said, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure, in prisons. It's not overnight jail. It's not a 30-day sentence. In prisons more frequent, in deaths often, in situations where many others died, but God brought me through. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Church, do you realize what he's saying here? Jesus suffered stripes once, Paul said five times, I was beaten and virtually left for dead. They said his body looked like a road map. I was beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Stoned. That hurts. Thrice, three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters. I'm reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 now. This is such heavy reading, you need to know where it is. I have it all 
underlined and yellowed and uh, marked and so on. Because when I have a bad day, I turn over and say, you know, I've got it pretty good. In perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. That means dangerous, life-threatening situations, in perils among false brethren. That, that one alone will do you in. In weariness and pain, weariness. You ever get tired, Paul? Said, yeah, when I'm weak, then am I strong. In painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst. In fastings often, in cold and nakedness. <laughs> Whew, one more verse if you can hang in there with me. Besides these things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. This man was sensitive to people. He said, who is weak and I am not weak? Or who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I'll glory in the things concerning mine infirmities. God's grace. God's steel-fisted Grace. Look at what Paul accomplished. Those were his sufferings. He wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. Went to the third heaven three times. Had revelations unlawful to utter. Boy, that's one that most preachers couldn't resist. They'd have a magazine and a movement on their revelations. Paul said, I've had revelations that are private between me and God. Endured disaster, persecutions, prison a gifted teacher of God's Word. You see that especially in the Roman letter. He'll, he'll tell you something, then come back and tell you why he told you that and make sure that you understood what he told you to begin with. Gifted teacher. An awesome witness. A soul winner. We don't think of Paul maybe so much that way. But he was. He was an awesome witness. Every time he'd stand before a ruler, he would say, let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Best way to witness. Don't argue just tell people what Jesus has done in your life. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. And I believe probably, I think I could honestly say he was, he was probably one of the world's greatest evangelists and soul winners, not as a Brian Hart Bonke or a Billy Graham or whatever, but remember under the Holy Spirit, he gives us Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Millions. Do you realize that? None of us realize how many millions of people have come to Jesus on the basis of just the Roman road alone. That the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Only three things you really need to know is that you're genuinely born again and know these three scriptures. You can go anywhere, anytime, and tell anyone about Jesus and close the deal if God will quicken that to happen. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. Awesome witness. The greatest positive thinker and motivator in the world. Do you realize that the, the basis of every true, honest, motivational book or seminar or whatever, it's not a dog-eat-dog -dog type of thing. Read what Paul said. Paul was a positive thinker. Paul had a positive faith attitude. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Norman Vincent Peale got a hold of that and it touched much and most of his world. Nay, in all of these things, lest you think you're the one that's left out. In all of these things, all of your things, all of my things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What a positive thinker, troubled on every side, yet not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us an exceeding an eternal weight of glory. I submit to you, this man was one awesome man. Once an enemy of the cross, an enemy of Christ, persecuted the church of God. He didn't just persecute them. He was responsible for Christians being killed. And I really believe the eighth chapter of Romans 
is Paul's answer to what kept his spiritual sanity, that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Thank God, thank God. At last, the past is, la- is past at last. But as I think of the last few days, I, I have been with some of the most diverse personalities, both in preaching and then in conferences. I've gone from virtually one extreme to another and stopped in between. <laughs> God's had me in some very, very wonderful and unique situations. I have experienced a unique anointing in each of these situations that I just go back and say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But you know, sometimes we think preachers don't know much. They don't go through much. You know, preachers, they're, they just have that, they're born with that grin on their face. And, you know, let me tell you something. Grace kept you before you got saved. Grace kept you before you finally got smart and agreed with God. What do you think kept you through all the stuff you went through? Grace kept you until you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. It was the grace of God. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. What kept you? Some of you have been at gunpoint. Others have been at Drugs and, and others were good moral people, but you know, one accident will take you out. I mean, if we could get the variety of circumstances that have happened to everyone in this room, and we'd be amazed to see all the times that good people should have died, not come through, not made it, but they did. What do you think that's all about? The grace of God kept you until you had enough God sense to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. The grace of God kept you before you got saved. The grace of God was responsible for us being saved. By grace are you saved. Through faith, yes, through faith, faith, grace. Grace kept you, introduced you, got you into the process, and faith Close the deal. God's grace has kept us since coming to Jesus. I've seen some, naturally as a pastor, start and stop, on and off, and red hot for God, and then the next time you hear them, oh, dear Lord. (laughs) I mean, we had one young man, God gloriously saved his life and sobered him up, and, and, and the Jesus, you know, hippie revival. Before the night was over, he was stoned on pot. He had genuinely been born again, but he didn't, for some reason, he didn't know what to do with him. Well, he got that settled down, and God delivered him, and he didn't go back that way. But before the night's over, he had mixed alcohol with with drugs and almost died. I mean, they had, if it hadn't been for grace of God and doctors and whatever. I mean, here's a guy. Weeping and God changing his life, but he doesn't, you know. You think of all the starts and stops. All the times you've been all fired up and I'm never going to miss another church service. I'm going to be in there. And then we don't see you for a month. Folks, it's God's grace that has kept us since we came to Jesus. Countless times, countless times. I I don't dwell on those times, but I was just thinking the other day, Going in Colorado years ago, very treacherous road at the top of the Continental Divide in a little Volkswagen, three of us going skiing. Going down the hill, we hit black ice. Al Marston turned around to me and he said, Bob, you better pray. He said, we're on black ice and I can't control this Volkswagen. And I mean, it was all over the road. And all three of us, said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It was as if an angel just got the back bumper of that little beetle and settled it down. Still on black ice. On one side, a total drop off. On the other side, there were some big trucks coming. Eternity either way. Thank God for the grace of God. Mama. 
God's grace has seen us through countless impossible times. Think of the hard times, the challenging times. The, you say, well, I'm young and I don't relate to all this. Well, honey, just hang in there. I hope your life is full of daffodils and birds singing in the trees and all that, but I've got to tell you, even when you get married, there's the first and 15th of the month. There's a lot of challenges in life. It's God's grace that has seen us through countless times. I talked to a very seasoned minister, and he said the first I believe he said the first three years of our marriage, it's a miracle we made it. And he he openly acknowledged it. He's a a great man of God and a great teacher. He said it was only the grace of God kept us together the first three years. We didn't realize how opposite we were. And some folks in ACE counseling out and fake counseling out, but now there's nasty now and now real life. And we find out that we've got to get along. I mean, you know, we didn't have all these wonderful books about marriage when Joe and I got married. It was kind of, kind of an Indian manual. Want them, got them, ugh, you know. <laughs> we discovered we had a real major difference early on in our marriage. She'd grab a toothpaste, tube of toothpaste, and choke it. Well, I'm not the neatest guy in the world, but I, I want to roll it up, you know. I want to move all that. Well, you know, through the years, I've gotten to be a squeezer, and now she's a roller. You know, it's, it's interesting. Life brings a lot of changes. <laughs> but it's all God's amazing grace, can you say amen? Let me just say it like this while I'm thinking about it. If it were not for the grace of God, there's not one of us that would be in this room today. Not one. Because no matter how sweet you are, how nice you are, how good you are, we're still human. And thank God for the grace of God. You don't have to walk on glass. You don't have to have a nervous breakdown every other hour of your life. You know that this iron-fisted love of God is working with us. And the only way it's not going to work if you just walk away and we'll have nothing, nothing to do with it. Personalities that I've talked with and been with over the last three weeks, here's one precious couple after many years lost their home and their furniture. I'll not go into the details, but there were... That's that's pretty good blow. Lose your house and all your furniture after many years. Another lost their home. Eight feet of flood water in Katrina. Everything in there, everything, you know, you get eight feet of water standing in your house, it's all gone. Another minister's son committed some crimes unbeknowing to them, served time in prison. Another minister had a school staff go wrong and his church was being sued for millions of dollars. See, this is real life stuff that ministers have to face, pastors have to face, staffs have to face. Just as Friday came around, here's a man who's been married 35 years and we do the memorial service there. She's only 61, that's young, that's young only 61 years of age. And then there was another couple that I've known. In fact, God was instrumental in using us to give them a word that literally jettisoned them into a very, very successful ministry. But his health, he's not that old, but I mean, he went through a real health trial. Doctors couldn't find out what it was. It was something in the system. They couldn't figure out what it was. And came to a point where he just was having difficulty functioning. So actually for about, I don't know, for 12 to 18 months, he had to be out of the pulpit. And then two staff tried to take over the church and put him out and leave him with nothing. And, you know, when you put 30 years into a church or 25, you know, you just, 
you know, I mean, this is real stuff. You say, boy, you got us on a downer. No. But each one of these that I talked to, the grace of God kicked in. And God's giving another house. And God's giving some more furniture. And the son's out of prison and doing well now. The church is back under the pastor where it should be. And the other two guys have gone wherever they should go. So why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes it happens in spite of everything that happens. And that's your moment when you either say, when I understand and when I don't understand, I believe God. Some preachers stop praying for the sick when one of their favorite members passes away or when a member of their family doesn't get their instant healing. We are not of that sort to turn back. God's word is real regardless. God told my wife, believe my word above everything else. And my wife stood and withstood and stood. And I thank you for your faith. She's amazing. I try to be protective of her, but I've been through two or three tailspins of just, you know, pressed to the wall and, you know, scheduled and stuff. And I'll tell you what, boy, she just puts those little iron wings out and starts flying and starts preaching to me. It's amazing. I want to read this lest I forget it. And I'll probably repeat it again. Pastor Tom Hemstock, he asked if he could speak a word when I got through with the memorial service. Boy, God really helped us. We saw people's lives changed. And up in that part of the country, they'd never seen any. They'd not seen a memorial service like we, you know, we celebrate and we honor those that have gone on, but we give the plan of salvation and we really tighten the screws. It's amazing. We saw God do some awesome things in some people's lives they said had not had change in God knows when. But Pastor Tom said, could I say a word? And he stood up and he said, live your dreams today. Don't put them off until tomorrow. I was in the coffee shop in, in Tampa and there were different ministers there. This minister's wife that they'd gone through, the attempted coup, and it, it, was, it was ugly. It was just ugly. And we have not had a chance to talk and uh, we just sat there, my other ministers, and I, she said, let me tell you about it, Pastor Bob, because you were a part of the beginning of our ministry. I said, yeah, I want to hear it. And she told me the things that had happened and come down and what her husband had gone through, and then their car was stolen, and it's just, it just one thing after another. She's not real big. She's just about so tall. She looked at me, and she said, you know what? I discovered something. I said, what did you discover? She said, the iron-fisted grace of God brought us through. I said, say that again. And I started writing. She said, the iron-fisted grace of God brought us through. What should have put us under legally, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? There was a giant iron-fisted hand. And let this microphone be called grace. The grace of God that is in your life and my life. The iron-fisted grace of God. That grip that would not let go brought us through. Man, it was all I could do to keep from shouting. And I said, that's it. That's it. That I love things that are said very simply. Because it's true of your life and your life and your life and my life and our lives. All the things we've encountered and, you know, just stuff. Young people face a lot of stuff nowadays. Life's not as simple as it used to be. Life can be very complicated. Young people are facing a lot more choices to do right or to do wrong. But if you want to be kept, and that's the key right there, you be kept by the power of God. If you want to be kept, don't you dare say, well, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go down the tubes. That's what you're going to do. 
But purpose in your heart today, regardless of what wind may blow, what storm may come my way, what may move beneath my feet, it's that iron-fisted grace of God that is going to see us through. God will see you through. God will see me through. God will see us through. Well, I just don't know. I just think I'll go back to this world. Oh, you pitiful thing, you. Don't tell me when you've eaten a T-bone or a filet mignon or you've had a tenderloin that you want to go back to the garbage bin of some fast food and get your hands in there and claw it out and call that food. No matter what we have to go through, we've gone too far to go back. There's no work. You have to just be like that Grecian statue. You know, you just sit there all day and think, you know. Just don't do anything stupid. Just hold steady. Hold steady. Don't do anything under pressure. Don't make any real important decisions under duress or pressure. Hold steady. Hear from God. And I don't know about you, but this is a life-changing expression. I've written it out in my Bible. That little preacher's wife, husband was flying back from, from his city. He went and preached there, and then he came back the next night. But that precious little couple, she just looked me in the eye, and she said, Pastor Bob, it was the iron-fisted grace of God that brought us through. So one more time, Paul, talk to us. I'm the least. I'm not the most important person in the church. I'm not even worthy. In the natural, I'm not worthy to be pastor of this church. I mean, who am I? Except for the grace of God that called me and has kept me. For I'm the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle. I did terrible things. Would you like all the things you did to be flashed on this video? There'd be several new entrances made in the walls. I persecuted the church of God. Folks, if you haven't underlined it by now, for gracious sakes, do it. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By that iron-fisted grace of God that will not let go, God brought us through. And God will bring you through. And all those stories that sounded like sad stories, the end of those stories was the grace of God made the difference.